Okay, I think we can get started. Good morning, everyone. In Brooklyn, we say it better, you know, we are loud and we make everybody energetic and live. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, that's how we do it. <laughs> anyway, I would like to first of all welcome all of you to the first uh, annual Cancer Health Disparities Symposium. Uh, I bring to you greetings from the president uh, who wanted to be here but couldn't make it. Uh, the dean also wanted to be here but they had other commitments and they couldn't make it. Uh, but they asked me to uh, extend their greetings to you and then to uh, uh, express to you their commitment to making uh, all the efforts uh, in this program and uh, the P20 grant successful. Uh, having said that, um, I'd like to thank all the organizers, uh, particularly um, Laura Martello, who has done so well uh, in putting the program together. Again, this is the first time we're doing it. Uh, we would learn from this experience, and we're going to expand on this experience to the next uh, conference, and we hope to expand and reach more people so that we will have a more robust representation of what all this cancer health disparities uh, conundrum looks like. Um, <clears throat> now, why are we doing this? Cancer is big, cancer is huge, cancer is a problem. Uh, you know, most families would have, you know, somebody that they know who has suffered from cancer. But we also know that, you know, minority populations typically have higher risk for cancer than uh, Caucasian populations. The science is good. The question is, how do we then design systems and processes in place so that those who are underrepresented and have high risk for cancer can have the same equal quality uh, of care for their conditions. Uh, so we came up with this because um, SUNY Dow State, uh, SUNY Stony Brook, and Cold Spring Harbor have long histories in this area of research. Um, and the three have really collaborated you know, very well to put together a very nice uh, NIH fund uh, grant to explore how we could make all the cancer health disparities, uh, especially in GI, uh, you know, to the benefit of minority populations. We have the populations, we just have to figure out the best way to design studies to study them so that we can benefit, the, those populations can also benefit. So, uh, it, so, so the conference is sponsored by the three groups, uh, Stony Brook University, uh, Stony Down State, and Cold Spring Harbor, and all of the people are represented here. Also represented here is the uh, Division of uh, uh, Hematology, Oncology, and Gastroenterology. I see a lot of uh, some basic scientists also in the audience um, and, and in uh, public health. So this is very important for us uh, as a beginning. So I would stop here, and then she would give some greetings, and then we would continue to announce some housekeeping stuff. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for all braving the snow to come uh, to this uh, in initial annual symposium. Basically, this celebrates um, the formation of a partnership between SUNY Downstate, SUNY Stony Brook, and Cold Spring Harbor. And that partnership has been successful in gathering funding from the state of New York, SUNY Health Network, and now more recently by the NCI with the NIH planning grant for us uh, to further develop this partnership. And uh, this symposium is highlighted. We're gonna have terrific speakers, and I have the honor of introducing the uh, keynote speaker um, Dr. John Carruthers, who's Searle Professor of Medicine at the University of Michigan. He is a noted researcher in colon cancer, uh, molecular biology, and um, uh, his, his talk will be on contribution of DNA mismatch repair defects and um, inflammation towards outcome from colorectal Cancer in African Americans. Um, thank you for, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Carruthers from the University of Michigan. Just a few housekeeping before oh, you start. Oh, no, oh, just oh. wait. No, you oh, can wait. Just, just a few housekeeping. 
Uh, this is a CME uh, program, so you would see uh, the evaluation in your packet. Please try your best to, uh, to fill that out. It's a requirement so that we can uh, build upon the experience. Um, please hold on your questions until we get to the panel session uh, so that we can go through the, uh, the, uh, the lectures more smoothly. Uh, we want all the speakers to stick with the time allocation so that we can, uh, we can finish on time. Uh, and there are breaks in between. The breaks are 10 minutes. The, the questions and answers are 15 minutes each, but the breaks are 10 minutes. So there's 25 minutes to relax and then uh, spare the brain from the bombardment. Uh, so, but, but when we go on the break, please come back on time so that we can start on time uh, and then be done. So yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, again, I am the director of the Health Disparity Center. I represent the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. We're very happy to have all of you here and then our student book partners and our esteemed guest who's gonna give us a keynote uh, lecture. Thank you very much. First, let me thank uh, Dr. Morrow and, and Alan for the wonderful introduction. You know, having uh, a type of grant like this at the institutions here is wonderful. It's a lot of hard work. I really um, uh, am impressed by the, the dogmatic uh, perseverance for getting this done. I still remember meeting Ellen at uh, Sto Stony Brook probably a year and a half ago and said she was going to do this and work with uh, people here at Downstate and Cold Spring Harbor. And here we are, you know, a year and a half later with the grant. So that's wonderful and I want to congratulate you uh, on, on achieving that. So I'm going to talk today uh, just some general concepts and then get into some specifics on some of the work that we've done and some of the work that other people have done uh, that's out in the literature on DNA mismatch repair. I don't have any disclosures other than NIH uh, and University of Michigan uh, funding. Uh, again, congratulations to the grant, uh, a wonderful partnership. I hope it will go beyond the four years of the grant and hopefully you'll hear, uh, we'll be in our 15th or 20th year at some point. Um, so I'm going to talk just uh, a few slides, most of you will know this about there's racial disparities in colorectal cancer. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about microsatellite instability and in race in colon cancer. And then another form of microsatellite instability that some people may not be familiar with is something called EMAS, and we've been studying this recently in race in colon cancer, and then try to summarize that. So I hope I can do that in the next 45 minutes. So this is no surprise to us. This is data from the American Cancer Society that highlights the uh, five uh, largest races in the United States and looks at the incidence of colorectal cancer between males and females as well as the deaths of colorectal cancer between males and females. And the overall rate uh, in, in um, uh, the United States is about uh, 50 per 100,000 for male and 37.8 for females and then with a, a death rate of 19.1 and 13.5, respectively. But if you look at these five races, the highest is among African Americans. This has been persistent as ACS has been collecting data for the last 30 or 40 years. That still remains high. If you look at people who get colon cancer and look at their stage in survival, there's a similar disparity. Even though this is only by a few percent, this is amplified by the number of people who get it. So if you look at localized or regional disease in the kind of the brownish color, uh, African Americans tend to present uh, uh, with less localized and less regional and more uh, distant uh, when they present with their colorectal cancers. And if you do have colorectal cancers, compare this uh, African Americans to Caucasians, um, the survival is persistently lower even at localized disease as well as regional um, and overall for all stages of colorectal cancer. So this is no surprise. This data has been very consistent for 30, 40 years. Now it's very interesting, those, those, there's still that disparity even if you look at all the things that have been done, it, particularly in the United States with trying to get earlier screening uh, uh, in the United States. So both for males and females, there's still this persistent gap uh, if you look at the trends. Of note, if you go back 30 or 40 years, uh, it, it didn't look like there was a disparity. Now there's been argument of why these uh, graphs cur uh, cross back then. It might have been the actual data itself uh, or that, uh, that once the data were accurate that the disparity was exist. But certainly in the last 
uh, 30 or 40 years, there's been a large disparity between males and females in the trends. There's a lot of uh, theories out there. Um, is this socioeconomic, insurance and education? And there's def definitely disparities in that in the United States. Is it access to medical care? There have been a, a number of studies that try to equate socioeconomic status and the instance and in, in, uh, morbidity from colorectal cancer. Is it, is it the location of the tumors? In fact, there's plenty of data suggesting that there's increase in right-sided lesions amongst African Americans. Is it the type of diet and, and, uh, and, and change in the environment, the local environment based on metabolism, the microbiome, and those types of things? Obesity uh, can also play into that role. Is it higher rates of tobacco use, which can affect or hormone replacement therapy or NSAIDs? Or is it just people don't want to go see doctors because there's mistrust of the health system? I've been focused, uh, although I think um, all these things probably come into play, um, ultimately they're going to have an effect on the biology. So my study has been actually been on is there differences in the biological aspects of tumor or metastasis. So uh, akin to that, I'm going to tell you about two forms of defective DNA mismatch repair um, and then tell you a little bit about them and then uh, explain some of the differences that we found, particularly between African Americans and Caucasians. The first is this microsatellite instability pathway. So just to give you a preview of that, we have billions of cells. They are exposed to a number of different things, and your DNA is bombarded with, with uh, a number of different, I'll say, carcinogens that can modify and damage your DNA, leading to mutation and leading to disease. In a typical somatic cell, such as your skin cell, that sloughs off, who cares? You know, you form keratin cells that sloughs off. Same thing happens in the GI tract. We refresh our GI tract every three to seven days. But if you hit a stem cell, in which, which those cells go on to propagate other cells, a damage in that cell can, can have long-lasting effects in the progeny cells that that stem cell uh, produces. Outside damage can, conform, can, can come from in the forms of oxidative damage, UV light, other carcinogens and xenogens that uh, expose the environment, but they can also be intrinsic. We have spontaneous deamination events uh, of cytosine that can convert it to uracil that has to be corrected in our DNA. Also, we make progeny cells. There are areas of replication. The polymerase makes mistakes, rarely, but it makes mistakes, and if those mistakes aren't corrected, the progeny cells will have mistakes in them. Any of these things can lead to a block in DNA replication or transcription, cause genomic instability, impair gene expression, uh, and be mutagenic. And so if the damage is persist in the progeny cells, you can have a mutation event that can lead to formation of uh, a cancer, at least tinnitus, or if the cell sloughs off, or if you have some other type of immune surveillance that can remove that cell, the cell will die. Fortunately, for some of the intrinsic as well as extrinsic uh, damage to DNA, we have repair mechanisms. Now we have several types of repair mechanisms. We have some that have moderate fidelity and some that have very high fidelity. The moderate fidelity ones are usually the ones that involve double strand DNA repair. Those two, uh, double strand breaks. Those two, one of them is called homologous recombination, the other is called non-homologous injoining. They involve a series of proteins when DNA has breaks in them that will coat those breaks and rejoin the DNA, okay? And they involve a series of proteins I won't go into. We have three other areas that have high fidelity repair. DNA mismatch repair, which I'm gonna focus on today, nucleotide excision repair, and base excision repair. These, these processes have been worked out over the last 40 years uh, to repair DNA at different phases of the cell cycle, but to basically correct mistakes that happen in DNA from either outside exposure or intrinsic damage. Uh, and each one has a different process. Basic excision repair removes chemical modifications largely. Nucleotide excision repair repairs helix distortions. And mismatch repair really repairs post-synthetic uh, mistakes by the polymerase. 
This was recognized this last year with the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize was given for DNA repair. These three gentlemen, each with key, understand key processes for base excision, nucleotide, and DNA mismatch repair uh, were recognized this last year and then in December in Stockholm. Paul Modrich, uh, his model was bacteria. And when I'm telling you about DNA mismatch repair, this is an evolutionary conserved system, goes to unicellular organisms, all the way to us as complex organisms. So what is human DNA mismatch repair? These are a series of proteins, as I said, mentioned, they're evolutionary conserved, that work together to repair mistakes in DNA after DNA is replicated. You can lose complete, you can have complete loss of mismatch repair if you take out certain proteins, MSH2, MLH1, or PMS2, or you can have partial loss with loss of MSH6 or MSH3. These proteins work together as heterodimers, and it requires their stability as partners as heterodimers. So MSH2 will compare with MSH6 or MSH3, and in the humans, MLH1 pairs with PMS2. As I said, these two work together and, and becomes much more stable. In this example, this is a colon cancer from one patient who has lost MLH1. If you notice, the staining is missing for MLH1, but it's also missing for PMS2, PMS2 because once MLH1 is taken out, PMS2 becomes unstable as well and loses its protein expression. Uh, here, MSH2 is expressed, as is MSH6, and if I stain for MSH3, it would also be expressed. When you lose these repair proteins, you get something called microsatellite instability. It's a biomarker that tells you that the major portion of mismatch repair is loss. There are also tumor suppressor genes. You put this in overexpressed in the cell, your cells won't grow because it shuts down the cell cycle. The proteins work as follow. As I said, they work in pairs. They recognize mistakes in DNA. Here in this example, this normally A binds with T on the opposite strand. Here's CT this pair. These proteins work almost as a clamp will surround the DNA and survey the DNA as a sliding clamp, and they'll recognize this distortion, the CT mispair. It'll call the partners MLH1 and PMS2 to bind it, and then cause signaling, hopefully for a repair. If the damage is overwhelming, it may signal for cell death. Now, when in the previous slide, I said if you lose these two proteins, you get partial loss and that's because they have different fidelities for recognizing mismatch repair. So MSH6 will recognize single base <coughs> mispairs, as shown here, or small insertion deletion loops of one or two nucleotides. The two MSH2, MSH3 pair will recognize larger insertion deletion loops. So what does that mean? Well, we have uh, microsatellites, which are a series of repetitive sequences in DNA present 100,000 times throughout DNA on all chromosomes. They're used for sites for homologous recombination. Most of them are in non-coding sequences, although some can be in coding sequences. So any of these AAG showed in this tetranucleotide repeat can pair with any of the TTTCs on the opposite strand. If they don't quite pair up, you form an insertion or deletion loop depending on the template or the newly synthesized strand. Think of it like a broken zipper. You got a piece sticking out or you skip the piece. That is recognized by this MSH2, MSH3. Uh, it'll signal an exonuclease to come in, take out that piece of DNA. The polymerase will resynthesize it and try to put the correct number of repeats there such that you maintain the fidelity of DNA. So that's essentially how mismatch repair works. Why is this important? Well, when we look at how colon cancer forms, typically, um, for the most part, colon cancer, you'll have damage in a, st uh, uh, in a colonocyte stem cell, and then that damage, uh, typically to APC gene, will cause uh, abnormal growth proliferation over uh, much faster than the surrounding normal cells, so you get an excrescence or a bump, or what we call early polyp, or aberrant cryptophosphate initially, and then other mutations accumulate in there 
to essentially give you a polypoid lesion. And then as these keep continuing to clonally expand, more damage happens, you acquire other mutations that allow it to turn into cancer. And these are some histologic examples of what these pops look like and some of the early cancers. In fact, some of these cancers are shown here are these flat type cancers, which we tend to see in the right side of the colon um, and can sometimes be hard to, uh, to spot. So there's a process. The, particularly in the microcyte instability, this is one of the, I'll say, three major pathways for you to get colon cancer. If you want to drive from here to Florida, you might be able to take three or four different routes. But you will get to Florida, right? Okay, that's your end zone. So these are three, these are three different described pathways to get to colon cancer. So they can take different routes, and at the end of the day, it looks like colon cancer. Although their response to chemotherapy, their, uh, the, the path they took, and the, their consequences might be slightly different, even though at the end of the day, they all look like colon cancer. The one I'm talking about is the microcell instability pathway. It's seen in about 15% of, of uh, all colorectal cancers. Uh, goes through the same process as the chromosome instability or the CIMP pathway. But you generally accumulate a multitude of frame shift mutations because you've lost mismatch repair, you get microcell instability, and you cause frame shifts at those microsatellite sequences. This is also important because the biological behavior is different. In classic chromosome instability pathway, it takes you about five decades where you get a polyp, tumor initiation, and it takes another a decade or two to get a cancer. Similar with microcell instability, it may take slightly longer, but the pathway, the tumor uh, promotion, once you get that polyp to cancer, is greatly accelerated by the nature of loss of mismatch repair and these multiple mutations that can occur. So that, that tumor progression is much shorter. Now it's interesting, once you get the tumor, you, uh, it may take you longer to get metastases, and I'll explain why. But the behavior is different than the other pathways. So what are some of the key features of, of tumors that have microcyte instability? Well, they display, they display microcyte instability, they lost mis mis repair, and they'll lose protein expression, like I showed you in that one immunohistochemistry. They're more common on the right side of the colon, particularly in the germline form we call Lynch syndrome, as well as in the sporadic form, which is basically by taking out MLH1, 70% of these are in the right side of the colon. They often show, show poor differentiation and mucin producing. About 40% of these tumors compared to less than 10% of, of non-MSI colon cancers have mucin components in it, and I'll show you a histology of that. These tumors are hypermutated by the nature of loss of mismatch repair. Uh, they contain 100 to 1,000 somatic mutations in the tumor because there's constant frame shifts going on. But these tumors are diploid. This is different than the chromosome instability pathway where there's chromosome breakages and losses causing uh, aneuploidy and they lack P53. They took a different road to Florida than the chromosome instability pathway. Now the other interesting thing is because of these frame shifts, this type of colon cancer, microcell unsta unstable colon cancer, will attract certain types of immune cells, particularly T cells, and that's because of all these frame shifts, they can create neoantigens, new protein molecules that are immunogenic that actually slow down the rate toward metastases, and I'll show you examples of that. And they're more susceptible to anti-PD-1 uh, 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 checkpoint blockade. A lot of the work that we did, and I'm not going to go into, is that these tumors are also much more resistant to typical 5-FU-based chemotherapy. And that's now been adjusted in some of the oncologic protocols. Despite that, patients with microcellular unstable tumors tend to live longer. And that's largely because of that immune uh, response that they generate from those neoantigens. So let me walk you through a couple of those things. So this is the data from the TGCA um, data set. I love this slide because there's so much information on this slide. Um, if you look at the mutations, essentially this is somatic mutations in tumor. And if you take the ones that have a lot of somatic mutations compared to those that don't, you break it down into two groups, hypermutated and non-hypermutated. And then you look at what happens to microcyte instability. 
essentially all the microsatellite unstable tumors are in the hypermutated group. That tells you you lose mismatch repair, you get lots of mutations. The driver for that, particularly for sporadic colon cancer, is uh, MLH1 silencing. These tumors, you, they, they get methylation of MLH1, which is a DNA mismatch repair gene, takes out its function, and you get microcell instability as a consequence, okay? The other thing is that uh, on the bottom piece of this, it tells you the pathway, the hi which highway it took to get to Florida from here. The gene complement of mutations are completely, almost completely different for a microcellulite unstable tumor compared to one that doesn't have microcellulite unstable. And look at the type of genes that are mutated. Active and type 2 receptor, TGF beta, APC, etc. Okay? And that's largely because in those genes there's coding microsatellites that are sus more susceptible to frame shift for the most part. Compared to those that didn't take that highway, or the non-hypermutated ones, where you typically get classic APC, P53, KRAS type of mutations. So the two most common genes mutated in a hypermutated or MSI high tumor is activin type 2 receptor and TGF beta type 2 receptor. And that's because in the exonic coding sequence of these genes, they contain microsatellites that are susceptible to that broken zipper model I told you. They can shift, they cause a new stop codon, they make a truncated protein, and they generate a neoantigen that can be immunogenic. This is the histology I was talking about. Classic microsatellite instability, poorly differentiated, lots of mucin content, about 40%. Because of the neoantigens and frame shifts, if you look at the cancer, some of the tumors right under the epithelium will have what we call a Crohn's-like response. It's called Crohn's-like because in, in Crohn's you can get granulomas. These are not granulomas. These are lymphoid aggregates that are responding to those frame shift neopeptides. And if a good pathologist, if you have a good pathologist, they can look at this and say, this is an MSI high tumor because this is almost a telltale sign of an MSI high tumor. Subepithelial lymphoid aggregates because of the response to those neoantigens. You can also get uh, tumor infiltrated lymphocytes as well. So, this was shown by a guy named Shortali, uh, a European group. They took the tumor from MSI high and non MSI high patients. They extracted the uh, T cells out of those tumors. At the same time, they made the predicted frame shift mutations of about 20 different proteins. And they wanted to see if the T cells responded to those. The answer is if you had an MSI high tumor, it responded. If you did not have an MSI high tumor, they did not respond, so, so showing that they were immunogenic. They also took the T cells from the peripheral blood. And they showed that in MSI high colorectal cancer patients, the T cells responded. Uh, if you didn't have MSI high, they did not respond. They took a Lynch syndrome, a germline mutation in one of the mismatch repair genes. They responded if they had colon cancer. And even if they didn't have colon cancer, so they had a germline proven mutation, they already had a pre-immune response to them. So these things are made by these frame shifts that, that can stimulate the immune system that essentially leads to a protective mechanism for these tumors. So this is the way I think of it for MSI high tumors. You get alteration of mismatch repair. That could be at the germline or sporadic, which sporadic is really MLH1. You get target gene mutations like TGF beta, ACVR2, um, that frame shift, create neoantigens. That induces a T cell protective inflammation. And those patients, despite getting tumors, have reduced chance of metastasis. They tend to present at earlier stages and they tend to live longer uh, compared to those who don't have this process. We studied this in a racial background. So this is a population-based study. We have samples from North Carolina. This is Bob Sandler's group at UNC, who graciously allowed us and is a co-author on this paper that was published. Um, we looked at 503 uh, colon cancers from 33 counties in 
uh, North Carolina that were collected on a population-based sample. They hit counties that were more heavily African-American, such that about 45% of the cancers came from blacks, 55% came from whites. When we analyzed the microsatellite's unsta uh, unstable uh, status of these tumors, overall about 11% were microsatellite unstable, but they were different between the races. Caucasians had 14% of the tumors microsatellite unstable, blacks had half that, 7%. Okay, so, so half, this is a population-based sample. So half the rate of MSI. Now, it won't explain the whole disparity, but certainly this could contribute to some of the disparity if MSI gives you a much better survival capability. When you look at the MSI tumors compared, so race was a, uh, it was more segregated with whites than blacks, so MSI high. That was statistically significant. And in the other four things I'm showing here from published from this paper, those were known things suggesting that our cohort was really truly exactly what we expected. Uh, they tend to be mucinous, poorly differentiated, have that Crohn's-like reaction, and be on the right side of the colon. So this seemed to be, this seemed to uh, match up. Now if you look at any difference between white MSI patients and black MSI patients, nothing came out statistically different. However, uh, there was a trend to be slightly more female, and a, a trend uh, to be um, slightly younger for blacks. But it didn't quite reach statistical significance even with 503 uh, cancers overall. Now if you look at the non-MSI, the microsatellite stable ones, um, uh, and this is uh, also again uh, akin to what ACS has put out, African Americans are, tend to be younger, in our cohort about two years younger, and uh, there are slightly more females with microcellulite stable uh, colon cancers, but nothing uh, uh, actually, uh, and, and more right-sided. So this is, this is uh, also, uh, so our cohort seem to be consistent with some of the things in the literature as well. The other thing we found, uh, we looked at the CD8 positive T cells, because those T cells that are, are immunogenic uh, seem to be CD8 positive as best we can tell. Uh, so we looked at the count. So first of all, all overall, microcellular and stable uh, tumors are associated with a high CD8 count. In fact, our average count per high power field was 88 compared to 30, okay? And this is, this is consistent with some other papers in the literature. When you compare African Americans to Caucasians, we found no significant difference. However, consistently we found that the high responders were absent from African Americans. So even though this was not statistically different of uh, 76 versus 95, uh, when you compare the medians, um, uh, the uh, high responders were consistently active. And we've looked at a couple other cohorts, and this seems to be considered. There tends to be no one in the 400 to 800 range compared to uh, Caucasian samples, uh, even though overall averages were not statistically different. And, and there was no difference in the non-MSI high ones as well. Now, Luis Diaz published a paper last May or June uh, looking at MSI high colon cancers and PD-1 blockade. So PD-1 blockade has kind of revolutionized um, treatment of certain types of cancers, particularly melanoma. And he discovered uh, that if you um, have um, tumors that have microcytes instability and you treat with anti-PD-1 blockade, they tend to respond. This is by markers as, as well as by the size of the tumor. So the blue ones are the MSI high tumors, okay? The survival is markedly different as well. You get about twice as long a survival with anti-PD-1 blockade uh, with a hypermutable MSI high tumor compared to those who are not, whether you look at uh, um, progression-free survival or overall survival. So PD-1 blockade, so even though you survive better, PD-1 blockade will increase your survival, okay, uh, as well. So just to summarize this piece of the talk, MSI high tumors generates neoangins, induces a protective type of inflammation, and they have high intraepithelial CD8 positive T cells. 
The patient prognosis compared to those without MSI high are better. They tend to be 5 u resistant. However, they're sensitive to PD-1 blockade. And based on a population-based cohort, it's half as common in African Americans versus Caucasians. And also, in the non-MSI high tumors or microcellulite stable tumors, there seems to be excess right side of colorectal cancer. And without going into other details, even um, the large studies by Doug Corley and David Lieberman on polyps, the precursors, they also found excess right side of polyps before you even get to the cancers in the right side. So it seems to be consistent with that. So now I'm going to switch to another form of microscopic stability we call EMAS. So EMAS, I didn't make this name up, but it stands for Elevated Microsatellite Alterations at Selected Tetratute Nucleotide Repeats. Horrible name, but EMAS is what I say. So traditional MSI has been defined by mono and dinucleotide alterations. These are tetranucleotide alterations. Some of this data goes back 20, 25 years. I remember a paper by David Sudransky out of Hopkins in 1996 showing that bladder, 19 out of 20 bladder cancers showed this, but they had no defect in MLH1 or MSH2. Of course, we didn't understand a lot of things back then compared to now. Um, so it was suggested that this was not a mismatch repair defect, even though now we know it is. This has been observed, as I said, in bladder cancers, but a series of other cancers. And one of the common things that you see in lies cancers is a link to inflammation. So now I'll come back to that. It was first described in colon cancer in 2008, up to 60% of colon cancers, making this much more common than methylation of MLH1, which is in 15% of colon cancers. Yet we didn't understand what, was the, what this meant or going on at that time. The key thing that has been discovered since then is that, um, uh, first of all, we understand the biology of mismatch repair a little bit better, and second, there's been some evidence for heterogeneous expression of MSH3, and knowing the profile for MSH3 for larger nucleotides, that's where the money was. So we did a study, this was published in 2010, uh, looking at some of just the biological characteristics of EMAS in colorectal cancer. And very interesting, we found that EMAS was associated with advanced stage, so worse prognosis. It was almost twice as common in African American samples, and this is from the same North Carolina study that uh, we sh I showed you in the MSI study. And it was heavily associated with peritumor inflammation. Not the Crohn's-like reaction that you get with the MSI high tumors, but more peritumoral, usually surrounding the uh, malignant glands and uh, much more uh, in the intratumoral cells. So they suggested that the, inflame, the, the inflammation cells were in, in intimate contact with the epithelium. So we published this about six years ago. The other thing, a completely different group showed that EMAS Likewise, we found in an advanced tumor stage also showed that it had the worst prognosis if you characterize it by this. So MSI high, I said, told you has better survival, right? And in their study, <laughs> no one died over those, those uh, what was that, 100 months or whatever. But those who had EMAS had the worst survival. Okay, so this is not our data, this is someone else's data. And it was just as statistically significant as stage, okay? So just to remind you back, where what is MSH3? So MSH3 pairs with two and works on these larger insertion deletion uh, models. Uh, so these are, this is a tetranucleotide sequence here, just to remind you. So these are some of the samples that we see. So you can take, this is MSH3 positive expression. This is a negative, and you can just take an MSH2 Lynch syndrome patient and show MSH3 is negative because remember it's, it's unstable once the MSH2 is gone. But these were the classic EMAS, so no other defect in mismatch repair, but we saw this heterogeneous expression, and if you look at the nuclei, and unfortunately this is not projected, it's probably not the best picture, but even the nuclei were heterogeneous in expression when those ex showed this tetranucleotide uh, frame shift instability. So we thought about that. So we have inflammation, intimate connection, 
uh, with immune cells and epithelium, and we're seeing this heterogeneous expression in the nucleus. So we're like, okay, so we looked for MSH2, uh, MSH3 mutations, didn't find any in these tumors. So we're like, huh? Okay, then we looked for epigenetic control of MSH3, didn't find anything. Where we hit on was uh, inflammation-driven MSH3 dysfunction. So no mutations or epimutations. But inflammation, let me walk you through this. So this green stand, uh, stands for MSH3. MSH3, as you see, is Gersane green here. DAPI stains the nuclei. Here's the overlap. Auto MSH3 is in the nucleus, where it's supposed to be, where the mismatch repair proteins are supposed to be to repair DNA. When you give IL-6, a pro-inflammatory pro cytokine, look what happens to the green. Disperses out of the nucleus such that it's no longer in the nucleus, okay? This is the nuclear cytoplasmic separation. So this is like taking the egg yolk away from the egg whites. So the egg yolk's the nucleus, the egg whites is the cytoplasm. So here's the nucleus. You give increasing doses of IL-6, MSH3 drops in the nucleus, and it gets acquired in the cytoplasm. It's very unique to this mismatch repair protein. It doesn't happen for 6, 2, or MLH1. This just shows the purity of the fractions. Histones are in the nucleus, tubulins in the cytoplasm. This changed almost 100-fold in concentration. So no mutation or epimutation, it just kicks it out of the nucleus in the setting of IL-6. Now I showed you IL-6. We looked at several other pro-inflammatory cytokines. It only did it with IL-6. IL-6 has two different pathways to signal. Uh, it has a membrane and a soluble form. Most cancers use the soluble form. IL-6 will bind into the soluble membrane partner with GP130, trigger the JAK stat kinase pathway, and signal it to the nucleus uh, through that. We blocked the soluble form of this. We blocked the IL-6 binding to it. We blocked with a drug to prohibit a stat-3 dimerization. Every time we did it, we blocked the movement of, of uh, MSH3. So as these are four different uh, cell models, IL-6, Give IL-6, it moves from the cytosol to the uh, nucleus to the cytosol, but it's blocked when you give all these different inhibitors in multiple different cell lines. We also put a constitutionally active STAT3 in. So without any IL-6 signaling, did STAT3 kick it out? The answer is yes. So here are, this was a, um, here's a uh, tin of transfection uh, where we put the constitutionally active, it's stained with this red mark flag. Okay, MSH3 stain with green when you merge them. The cells that are orange, it's hard to see the nucleus because the green is now dispersed. In those that didn't, you see very discrete nuclei showing that the MSH3 is in the, the nucleus. When you do the egg yolk, uh, egg white separation again, here's the control in the nucleus, nothing in the cytosol. When you transmit the constitutive active STAT3 in, all of a sudden you see some in the cytosol, and this is a couple of different cell models. Now, does this relate to human disease? So we looked at a huge number, and this, in this case, I think this is, represents about 40 different colon cancers. The ones that stay highest for IL-6 tend to be the EMAS positive ones. The ones that stay lowest for IL-6 tend to be the EMAS negative ones, so a good correlation. Also, what are you getting mutations in the nucleus if MSH3 leaves the nucleus? The answer is yes. When you give IL-6, within two weeks, you start accumulating mutations in genomic, human genomic sequences in the nucleus, within two weeks. MYCL1 and D9S242 are tetranucleotide repeats, and they required mutations within two weeks of two doses of IL-6. So you can imagine the colon, a cancer, being constantly bathed in inflammation and keeping MSH3 out of the nucleus and you start acquiring mutations. So the way I think of this, based on our data, is that MSH3 can move out of the nucleus with 
uh, inflammatory signals, particularly IL-6. Now, the data I'm not going to show you, because we haven't published it yet, but we're preparing the paper, is that we've interrogated NSH3 protein. There were three putative nuclear localization signals on it, two putative nuclear export signals on it. And we've interrogated them, mutated it, we found which ones are the bona fide ones. It turns out NES1 and NES2 have to work together. And of the three NLSs, only NLS1 was the bona fide one. When we mutate, you can prevent its movement as well. So it's, the signals are on the MSH3 protein. So when it comes in the nucleus, there's repair. When it slips out of the nucleus in response to inflammation, there's no repair and you can detect EMAS, the biomarker EMAS. So the way I think of it is, you initiate neoplasia, it doesn't seem to, MSH3 dysfunction doesn't initiate in me, in neoplasia, it seems to occur after. So you get inflammation, and how that starts, I don't know. But certainly once you get the inflammation, you alter DNA mismatch repair by moving, uh, kicking MSH3 out of the nucleus. And then something has to happen, you get mutations or other things. And then it's related to increased metastasis in this case. So two different forms of inactivation mismatch repair. One seems good and one seems bad, okay? But they're done by different mechanisms. Now, what happens here is a, a, a little bit of black box, but I'm going to show you some data how we uh, examine some of this. If you look at the fidelity of MSH6 versus MSH3, because they both partner with MSH2, their spectrum of recognition is different. They will recon uh, MSH6 will recognize single base mispairs, as I showed you in that drawing model, but MSH3 will not. They overlap at uh, loops of two nucleotides, and MSH3 is the one who repairs tetranucleotides, or loops of four. They both will recognize 5-fluorodeoxyuracil as well. So they both contribute to cell killing. So no mismatch repair, that's why they're more resistant to 5-FU. Okay, the MSH26 also recognize other types of uh, adducts in the DNA, whereas um, uh, MSH3 does not. However, if you treat with certain drugs, there's no data, but there's evidence in the literature that in the absence of uh, MSH3, you can tri trigger double strand breaks. Now, MSH3 is a very unique protein we find out. So in the last year and a half, there's been four papers coming out that suggest that MSH3 is not only involved in DNA mismatch repair, it's also involved in double strand repair. In fact, in particular, homologous recombination repair. In fact, it's in the same pathway as BRCA1 and BRCA2 on those molecules. Now, so when we, we were fortunate, um, and this is my last pieces of data here, we were fortunate to show, uh, to obtain from Asia almost 100 matched pairs of primary colon cancers with liver metastases. I told you that EMAS is associated with poor outcome in liver metastases, okay? So we wanted to see what could be the driver. If MSH3 gets frame shifts, are there more frame shifts in liver metastases compared to the primer? The answer is we didn't find much difference. We looked at 141 different loci throughout the genome, not much difference. But because of it's involved in double strand repair, we looked at loss of heterozygosity events. And this is where we hit the jackpot. So coming out in April's uh, edition of Gastroenterology, we found a site on chromosome 9P24.2 that is missing from 100% of liver metastasis. This marker, 66, uh, uh, I think 606, 6640. When you look at the primary in the red, matched with the liver metastasis in blue, um, uh, these sites were significantly enriched in the liver metastases for loss of this locus. Now it turns out this is near the SMARCA2 locus. It turns out it's not SMARCA2. Uh, there's something else there. We've done deep sequencing at that site. 
and it looks like there's a four exon something there. It's probably, my guess is a microRNA, but we haven't proven that yet. Um, but that seems to be lost. Now, what does that mean? Why, so why would you, well, who cares? What was it? So turns out when you lose it, you have EMAS and that, way better survive, way better survive. So even EMAS shows poor survival. It looks like that's a heterogeneous population. You lose this chromosome 9P24.2, and you get much better survival. These patients have metastases. They just live longer with their metastases, okay? Now, when you look at these samples, it turns out 9P24.2 is enriched in the people who got hepatectomies. So this could predict what the surgeon is prepared to do. We normally look at gross radiologic features. How many foci, how big are they are, and then, so keep in mind, these, by the way, these are not stage four patients initially. These are stage two and three patients with their metachnous leavings <coughs> years later. We were able to get these paired. So these are stage two and three, uh, and then we got their paired lesions from years later, and we can look at the genetics of that. So these are people who get metachronous liver metastases who get upstage years later. And it turns out, if you had a hepatectomy, 62% <coughs> of them had 9 PLOH. But those who did not, only 5%. So it is clearly enriched, and it could be a predictive marker for who should get a hepatectomy. So let me just summarize. Two forms of microscience stability, one called classic MSI, one called EMAS. Okay, this can be seen in microsat stable, but it also includes MSI. Germline cause, that's Lynch syndrome, mutation <coughs> mismatch repair gene, there's no germline associate for MSH3 loss. Sporadic, MLH1 hypermethylation, but for here, it's inflammation, alteration of the cellular location of MSH3. The prevalence in colon cancer, 15%, but this is up to 60%, so much more common. The inflammation, here you get those lymphoid aggregates. Here, it's more associated with the tumor nest and intimate uh, with the, um, uh, the epithelial components. The immune reaction is neopeptide-driven in MSI, has a favorable response. The drive for that is unknown in EMAS, but it seems to be unfavorable to lead to poor survival and later stage compared to MSI. The pathogenesis for these, target gene mutations, frame shift mutations, this is unknown, but could it be target genes? We haven't found in liver metastases just yet, but maybe double strand breaks and causing LOH events. In terms of race, half the frequency in American blacks, twice the frequent in American blacks here based on our studies. Response to 5U is muted here, but it's PD-1 sensitive. Here it remains efficacious. I didn't show you that uh, data, but we, we have a paper that was published on that as well. So the way I think of this now is that and this is my last slide. You have MSI or non-MSI tumor. EMAS modulates them. Now, does EMAS modulate a classic MSI tumor? I don't know fully, but certainly MSS by MSH3 cytosol sequestration to modulate that to give you poor survival. And by, as I said, with the 9P24.2 data, even EMAS can be modulated as well. And here's some of the associations uh, as listed there, listed there. So I will stop there. And I think there's a panel discussion, right? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to hold questions until the panel. Yeah. I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker. This is Dr. Jenny Williams, who's an associate professor in the Department of Family, Population, and Preventive Medicine. Did I get it right? Yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, she uh, leads one of the pilot research projects in our P20. And she'll be talking about her studies on colon cancer uh, uh, biological differences in uh, African Americans. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this event. Uh, 
And today I would like to talk to you about uh, genetic, epigenetic, and cancer health um, disparity. So um, what I'd like to do today is talk to you um, about uh, some of the work that I've been doing at Stony Brook. Uh, and to begin to tell you about racial health disparity, I have to get back to how I got started in, into this business, which is actually through uh, colon cancer, um, uh, chemo prevention, and chemotherapy. Um, once I started working with cancer, chemo prevention, and chemotherapy, I became aware of the fact that there are a group of uh, individuals or a group of races that did not respond to conventional uh, chemo preventive agents, uh, and even there were some that uh, chemo reverted uh, after taking the, uh, the compounds, uh, specifically 5 4 U cell. Uh, so this got me interested in understanding why this occur and then moving into racial health disparity and looking at uh, genetic and epigenetic genetic differences that could account for this. And so under this uh, guise, what we have been doing is omic analysis uh, with the um, interest in getting and in doing biomarker discovery and targeted uh, uh, drug therapy targets. Okay, so the biomarker development is for diagnostic and prognostic uh, um, uh, means as well as prediction of pharmacological responses. And the sources that we are using is tumor, um, adjacent normal tissue, uh, blood serum, and uh, urine and feces. So at the end of this conference, I hope you will get the um, appreciation of understanding the necessities of these studies, as well as the importance of establishing, establishing partnerships with institutions such as Downstate and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Okay, so everybody's seen a colon before, I'm sure, but um, not in this guise. Uh, so one of the reasons why we do colon cancer, are, well, n not one of the reasons, but colon cancer is actually a good model for uh, prevention. And the reason why is because if you, if you look from stage zero polyp to uh, cancer, to, to metastasis, uh, it takes anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Um, so there's a lot of period of time in there for intervention. And even though there is this long lag, we still see disparity in cancers. Um, the incidence of cancer, of colon cancer, varies nationally, uh, but it also varies regionally. Uh, we are in, uh, Stony Brook is in Suffolk County, and in Suffolk County, uh, as you can see, my light's not working? Oh. Um, there are regions that are, um, in which cancer is prevalent, and regions where it is, it is uh, uh, less than below 50% of the expected pop, um, population. And this actually occurs not only for, can't really see you here, sorry. This not only occurs for um, uh, region to region, but within the, even the same state, you take Stony Brook, you can see that uh, the difference between females and females is as different as well. Um, and if you look at Hampstead, it's, uh, the males have a better pop, uh, prognosis than Okay, and also when we look at Nassau County and Suffolk County, uh, the incidence of colon cancer is somewhat similar as well as uh, the mortality, but Nassau. The microphone here? Yeah, oh. Am I reverberating? Nice one. Ah. Okay. Nice one. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I see. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So in Nassau County uh, and Suffolk County, the incidence of, of colon cancer and racial cancer are almost um, identical, uh, except that uh, uh, even in mortality, um, Suffolk County is a little higher. Okay, um, but as you already heard uh, earlier, the burden of uh, cancer is more acute for racial and ethnic groups. And when you look at Suffolk County and compare uh, uh, the incidence uh, of colon cancer between Caucasians and African Americans, they're not very, that much difference. And the same thing for females as, um, as seen in the slide. However, when you look at mortality, it's, it gets very drastically different. 
And I'll go through this real quick because we've already seen this before. I heard this again before. But the, nationally, the incidence of, of colon cancer is uh, higher for both uh, male and female African Americans. Um, and even though the trends have been going down over the years, it's been going down also for African Americans, but the gap still persists. And this is also true and actually more extensive for uh, African American males uh, when you talk about mortality. So the attributing factors given to uh, this phenomena is uh, that African Americans or minorities in general are in poor health. They experience more significant uh, problems assessing care, uh, more likely to be in uninsured, and uh, often receive lower quality health care than other Americans. However, when you correct for these factors, uh, a disparity still persists. So, um, a number of studies have shown that there are genetic links uh, to colon cancer racial health disparity. And so, African American patients with colon rectal cancer compared to other populations respond poorly uh, or differently to chemopreventive agents. Uh, they have unique polymorphisms in uh, P53, uh, specifically one uh, PRO72 allele, uh, which is usually an arginine in uh, a normal uh, P53 wild type. Uh, they have more frequent high microsatellite instability, leading to differential or uh, different prognosis and, and uh, response to chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, they have distinctive mutation in the mismatch repair genes, as we, as we heard earlier, uh, which contribute to, again, uh, chemo resistance to chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, and it's more prominent uh, right-sided uh, proximal tumors. So what we are looking at are inherent factors, uh, factors that are inherent, uh, such as genetic and epigenetic, and those that are acquired through diet, environment, and uh, microbiota. So that's the uh, essence of, of my uh, study, which is somewhat uh, eclectic, but once we put it all together, hopefully we'll get something that's sound. So our general approach is to use retrospective and prospective tissues uh, and to go through the biology of understanding the contribution of genetics and epigenetics, looking at metadata so that we can uh, get an idea of the social economic status through um, uh, insurance or paid, whether they're paid or not, uh, diabet whether that they have diseases such as diabetic, um, diabetes, uh, they're obese, their age, the sex, the tumor location, stage of the tumor, and a number of other factors. So with the dietary, we're looking at food frequency questionnaires, and we're using a serum to look at micronutrient levels. Um, and for the microbiome, we're using 16S uh, sequencing. So our, um, in general, our, our research approach is uh, straightforward, but it's not uh, simple by any means. Uh, we acquire retrospective and prospective tissue from African Americans, uh, ca Caucasians, and uh, Hispanics. Uh, we isolate the RNA, DNA, and the protein, and we do a number of omic uh, analysis. Right now, uh, we are only doing uh, RNA-seq and microRNA uh, uh, sequencing. Uh, we're doing uh, um, DNA methylation and proteinomics. Uh, our, on the pipeline, the end pipeline, is the exosome sequencing in the 16S ribosomal uh, RNA. So one problem that we have, or one limitation to our studies, is the availability of racially diverse tissues for our research purposes, as well as the lack of existence of African-American cell line uh, for uh, in vitro and in vivo studies. Uh, ATC doesn't commercial, well, they have colorectal cancer cell lines, and they're either designated as uh, Caucasian are not listed at all, so we have no um, way of knowing whether or not there are African American cell lines in their repository. So we've been generating our own. Okay, another problem with where we are in Suffolk County is the fact that the population um, of African American uh, is low compared to uh, um, Hispanics as well as uh, Caucasians, um, with uh, Caucasians having, um, you know, the greatest number, uh, the population being the highest. Uh, so in order for us to uh, have patients, uh, acquire patients that uh, have colorectal cancer and will donate the, the tissue for research, we have to look outside of Stony Brook to places like downstate SUNY. 
So we have, um, have we actually have a number of different sources for, on which we are uh, obtaining our tissues. Uh, so we get tissue from Stony Brook, with the majority of them being Caucasians, uh, from Wash U, uh, from uh, Cooperative Human Tissue Network, which is part of NCI and NIH, um, from Downstate as well. And actually, Downstate I have 42, but last night Laura gave me 10 more, so I got 52 now. Um, North Carolina, we have only F um, Hispanic uh, 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 tissue from, um, and Northport, uh, we have a few as well, uh, the VA. Uh, one of the things that we have a problem with is actually getting fresh tissue, uh, which we need for, to make the, the cell lines. So uh, I have a, a, a IRB in place now with the, uh, Laura in which we are actually going to be getting fresh tissue and hopefully uh, create some cell lines. So right now we have three cell lines that we have passed, we have, have, have got, had, that have been passed uh, for more than two years. Uh, the first one that we acquired was CHTN06. Uh, so there's a three African-American cell line. And we have one um, patient-derived xenograft that is African-American, two that, that are Hispanics, and three that are Caucasians. Uh, this is just an example of one of our uh, cell lines, uh, CHNO26, which, which is uh, from a 69-year-old female African-American. Um, this panel just shows the cell in culture. Uh, this is a xenograph uh, showing that uh, these are tumorigenic in mice. So in order to characterize our cells, uh, what I should also mention is uh, one of these cell lines that we have here um, actually has a mismatch. Uh, it, it was de derived from um, a patient with a microsatellite instability and has a mutation in MLH1. Okay, um, so um, what we do for our cell characterization is proliferation assays, cell migration assays, uh, uh, morphology looking at EM, uh, phase contrast, mycoscopy, uh, H&E stick staining, and we look for the protein in, in uh, Western blots and immunofluorescence. So just to give you an example of, of CHTN06, uh, they express the epithelial uh, markers showing that they're epithelial cells. Um, they also uh, uh, express or overexpress some of the uh, main culprits of, uh, uh, that causes cancer. Uh, and also, uh, we saw that uh, with sequencing of P53, that there was a, a, a proline uh, at, at the residue 72, there was a pro-pro uh, variant form of the P65. So it has a single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, okay, so stepping back, going back to my early days, um, I started off in doing uh, cancer chemo prevention. And our early studies were based on the fact that it was observed that aspirin uh, reduced uh, or prevented colorectal cancer. And this is also true for a number of other cancers such as epigeal, gastric, uh, breast, and pancreatic. The problem with the aspirin, uh, using aspirin on a daily basis, is because it had toxicity and also uh, the efficacy was uh, actually low, anywhere from 15 to 15 to 50 percent. So in order to uh, in order to find or to uh, formulate drugs that were more ep had more efficacy and uh, lower side effects, we formulated uh, a number of NSAIDs that we call NSAID derivatives. And these had active groups uh, of, of nitric oxide and phosphate. There are also an, a few other ones, but these are the ones that I predominantly used. Okay, so just giving you an overall understanding of our, our drugs is that um, the efficacy is higher than the parent compound. The effect is in the cell kinetics. Uh, they inhibit cell proliferation and induce apoptosis. And they're highly effective in the animal model. And they exert their effects on several signaling pathways, uh, some being beta, um, nf kappa b beta catenin and P53. So we took our cell lines, and I'm just showing you CHT uh, NO6 right now, but we took our cell lines and we, we uh, subjected them to uh, um, treatment with several different compounds. And 
of these compounds, only one actually uh, did anything, and this was actually the cylindric, which is the parent compound. Uh, everything else was either two or three times higher than uh, commercially available Caucasian cell lines. Um, and uh, there was no uh, effect by 5 4 at all. So now, um, moving from uh, the cell lines into our uh, omics, uh, one of the first things we did was a microRNA array in which we took total RNA uh, I, that was isolated from tumors and peradjacent normal colon tissue, specifically uh, 31, African, 31 Caucasians and, thir and 30 African Americans. And we looked for uh, differences between uh, the tumor and the normal. And from that, we were able to, uh, we were able to deduce that there were 89 differentially expressed uh, microRNA between tumor and, and normal. And of this, 49 was upregulated and 40 was downregulated. And a lot of these were actually involved in uh, tumor suppression. Further analysis uh, showed that there were five that were uh, uh, significant for race and race effect and tumor effect. And of that, one was shown by quantitative PCR to be validated, which was one, uh, 182, which uh, targets the suppressor protein um, FOX1A1 and three, FOX3A. Of these two, um, when, we, when we looked at the downstream effect of uh, overexpression of um, MIR-182 using immunohistochemistry, uh, we were able to determine that a staining was higher for uh, the normal than for the tumor. So there is a, a correlation between uh, upregulation of MIR-182 and downregulation of the FOX1 and FOX3A. And even though there were less uh, uh, expression in the tumor in uh, African Americans, this was not significant. Also, uh, in collaboration with someone at, P, um, at uh, um, Washington University, we did P53 polymorphism studies. Uh, I sent her samples and uh, she combined them with some samples from WashU. And with that, we were able to uh, confirm, basically, because this is, is actually already a known fact, that uh, the um, at residue 72, uh, African-Americans have more pro-pro and odd pro uh, variant than the uh, Caucasians who have uh, wild type, more wild type arch arch. And just to give you context of this, uh, mutations in, in uh, P53 at this residue actually um, result in uh, loss of, of, of and induction of apoptosis. Um, also, it's also involved with uh, uh, chemotherapy resistance or losing uh, ability to uh, respond to chemotherapeutic agents. Okay, so like I said before, and this is a double slide, sorry, is that um, we are doing proteonomics, uh, uh, um, methylation studies, and RNA-seq. So with uh, the proteonomics, uh, I have a, a collaboration with someone in Columbia, and we have actually, only thing that we've done so far is actually optimize the conditions for obtaining proteins out of a formula fixed paraffin embedded tissue and taking that and uh, uh, determining the protein profile. So we've done this and as a preliminary study, just looking at Caucasian normal and um, African American normal, Caucasian tumor and African um, uh, American tumor, uh, you see a high increase of proteins in African Americans. Okay, so now what we're doing with Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories is a tandem study of DNA methylation and RNA-seq. And with this, we're using six African Americans and seven Caucasian uh, uh, colorectal cancer patients, tumors from those. Okay, so the problem that we had with our uh, methylation study, uh, before I get into the actual results, is that we had a low alignment uh, rate and a low read. 
And so our, in order to overcome this, our biostatistician, who I don't see out here, but he, he was here last night, um, he came up with this, this theme of which he called aligned, um, um, excuse me, um, trim and retrieving uh, alignment scheme. And with this scheme, he was able to increase our alignment and, and increase our number of uh, covered uh, GC sites. So using that formula, we were able to uh, uh, come up with a profile for African Americans and Caucasians. And of this profile, uh, 1,588 uh, in African Americans, we have 1,588 hypermethylated and 100 hypermethylated differentially, differentially methylated regions. And in Caucasians, we had 109 hypermethylated and four hypermethylated DMR, DMRs, uh, which represented a 14.6-fold and 25-fold change, respectively. This is just a list of some of those hypermethylated regions. I keep putting my finger over this. This is just a list of some of, of these hypermethylated regions. And of one of them, CHIL-1, uh, is known to be uh, when it's silenced, uh, it promotes uh, cancer, and also it's a target of MIR-182, which is a uh, microRNA that we have already shown to be dysregulated in African Americans. We also looked at the methylation of microRNAs as well, and in African Americans, we had uh, six microRNAs that were uh, hypermethylated compared to uh, African Americans with one. And the one that we did uh, uh, investigate further, uh, the target was uh, PAL R2 and uh, 2B and uh, CYP1B1, which uh, when upregulated, associated with uh, acquired chemotherapeutic resistance. Okay, and tandem, in tandem, we did RNA-seq. And of uh, what we got, it was a profile of uh, two, uh, 355 uh, dysregulated our, our um, uh, gene products in African Americans and uh, 130, uh, 142 in uh, Caucasians, uh, blue being upregulated and red being downregulated. And this is a list, uh, annotated list of those that were upregulated, downregulated uh, compared to Caucasians, uh, colorectal cancers. Okay, so what we have uh, done so far is preliminary studies are not necessarily preliminary, but uh, everything has been done on small sample sizes. So uh, what we need to do is validate what we have in a larger uh, uh, sample size. Uh, and what we, this is why we are partnering with uh, places like Downstate, so that we can acquire more samples and then generate uh, um, data that we can be more positive about. But right now, what we have so far is, is stimulating and, and it's promoting us to go further. Okay, so giving, us a, uh, giving you a basic theme of what we were trying to do here is what I would like to do is actually look at um, how social economic status uh, interfere with diet and environment and causes change in the microbiota, biota, which uh, affects epigenetics, uh, and which in general increases oncogenes and decreases tumor uh, suppressors and uh, lead to colon cancer. Uh, so that is was what I would like to uh, generally do with all of this uh, mishmash of stuff that I'm doing now. Uh, so my overall goal is to acquire a genetic, epigenetic, and molecular understanding of cancer and provide details that may assist in the development of chemopreventive agents that will span diverse populations. So what I would like to leave with you is that um, what I'm doing is not exclusive. It's an inclusive uh, uh, experiments because we are including all races and not excluding any. Thank you. I'm going to start with a question um, for uh, Dr. Carruthers, um, which I already asked him, but basically, hello? Um, basically, um, 
We're proposing these exome, um, whole exome, but with the findings you have with EMAST and all stuff, uh, you know, it seems like it makes sense that we do more targeted studies with the samples that we're doing. Maybe you could comment on profiling EMAST in the samples that we're, we've collected at Stony Brook and we are about to collect at Downstate. You know, additional tests we should target rather than this broad profiling. So, um, so thanks. So the question is, should you use EMAS in your studies? I think so, um, because we found this difference in race, and this was a population-based cohort. EMAS is done as easily as MSI analysis, because they're microsatellites, so you can do a PCR-based system. We've actually um, have a, um, a, a group of markers that we can do e MSI and EMAS simultaneously. So we, we're trying to patent that right now. Oh. No, no, that's okay. But, uh, but we, we can do it from our lab. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so you can, you can, instead of doing, you know, 10 or 20 PCRs, you can do it in one or two or three PCRs. So you can use oh, less material. Um, just, just tiny amounts. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, um, and so we've been doing this because we've been working on MSH3. We've been profiling almost every sample that we get from whatever study uh, to do it. So that's something that's easy to do, and you can probably add it at fairly low cost. Um, so. We're holding you to the low cost. Question. <laughs> 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 Uh, thank you, Dr. Carotters, for your wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, uh, now I know why I don't sequence MH MSH3 when I send out genetic testing on my Lynch, uh, phenotypically Lynch syndrome patients. Um, so it's kicked out of the nucleus. Um, and you said that is, there is a direct correlation, and you showed us, between IL-6 levels and MSH3 being uh, outside of the uh, nuclear space. Um, have you looked at obesity in your cohort? Because obese patients have higher level of IL, uh, IL-6 compared to normal weight. So the, answer, so the question was, um, with, the, with the inflammation in IL-6, kicking MSH IL-3 nucleus, is there associated with obesity? And have we looked at that? Um, I have not specifically looked at obesity. Um, the, the, the data I showed you were using models, because we were showing that uh, coming out of nucleus, and the association that we had were from samples, so I don't know if I had BMI on them. So the answer is no, I have not. I will tell you uh, another correlation, though, because one question that we had was, was IL-6 an effect on MSH3 solely done in cancers? The answer is no. Right. Um, in, the, in the paper we recently published, we show that it also occurs in non-transformed cells, we have an abstract that's accepted at DDW for those who are going to DDW, if anyone in the audience go to DDW, that shows that in colitis-associated cancers, 80-something percent will show MSH3 out of the nucleus and show EMAS. And then we also looked at just inflammatory bowel disease yes. with no cancer, right. because those are IL-6 uh, rich. Driven, um, yes. And we pick up EMAS there as well. Right. So it's not necessarily solely the cancer. What I think happens is MSH3, now that we understand it's involved in mismatch repair and possibly double-strand DNA repair, that, um, that I think the cancer hijacks that capability, kicks it out of the nucleus for whatever you know, reason, and then that gives it a little more aggressive phenotype. Um, in a normal somatic cell that's not a stem cell, this probably happens, just as we're seeing it in inflammatory bowel disease and other things. If you burn your skin or cut your skin, you probably get some of that. But because they're somatic cells and they slough off, you never see any consequence of it. So I think, so, and also there's a number of studies that some groups have published that show that MSH3 is not an initiator of cancer. So it seems to occur once the cancer is formed, it makes it more aggressive. But, I, but 
So that's a, probably a little more expounded on your obesity right. question, but then I... Right, but that's excellent uh, comments you made, because uh, uh, in Crohn patients that have not two mutation, they have a, a totally altered microbiome. They don't have rumnicoccus. And we have animal models that if we, um, in uh, notobiotic mouse model, if we insert a microbiome that doesn't have a rumnicoccus, they develop Crohn-like uh, uh, symptoms and disease. Mm. Uh, so, uh, have you looked at the microbiome uh, associated with uh, colorectal cancer in your cohort? So, so, I've been thinking about the right approach. I mean, my, my colleague here is a little more into that than I have. Um, uh, we do have a group at the University of Michigan that uh, there's a couple people looking at this. Um, the, for, for me, I have not jumped into it, although I suspect, I suspect the microbiota are playing a role setting up some of the inflammation, perhaps either as a consequence of the tumor and maybe um, because EMAS, as best we can tell, doesn't incite inflammation, it's a consequence of inflammation. So okay. how does the inflammation get there? That's a $64,000 question, but I suspect the microbiota has something to do with it, but I don't have any proof. Thank you. And for uh, Dr. Williams, if I may, one more one question. More one more. For Dr. Williams. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Williams, you do the microarray analysis through uh, microarrays or next-gen sequencing? Uh, the first ones that we did was for um, uh, microarrays, but uh, what we're doing now in, uh, with the Cold Spring Harbor is next seek. Okay. And the... No, that was your last one. That's your last question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Dr. Williams. Thank you very much, Dr. Carruthers and Dr. Williams. I'm very intrigued by this EMAST, uh, and you mentioned it's in 60% of cancers in African Americans. What about polyps? Should we be checking this on all right-sided polyps? Is there an easier way, like a surrogate marker, to check for this? And I would think it would impact surveillance and possibly even treatment. So, uh, as I said, EMAS is probably not an initiator of, uh, of information. So we did publish a paper in Gastro probably I want to say four years ago, that looked at um, polyps as well as cancers. And what we found, it was higher in um, the flat and particularly those polyps that have ulceration and have some type of inflammation around there. But the percentages were much lower um, compared to uh, the cancers. So cancers, right, it's in the 50 to 60 percent range. And the polyps was more like in the 10 to 20 percent uh, range and it seemed to progress as the pop moved to cancer. So I wouldn't necessarily think that you'd have to survey EMAS and pop because you typically remove the polyp for the most part. And I don't know if, if I can show that, at least there's no evidence that what happens in the pop is that a predictor, but certainly in the cancer it could be a predictor, but I'm not sure in the pop. And to detect it, by the way, again, you can just use these markers. Quick follow-up. So is there data on natural history of polyps positive for EMAST being different from those negative? No, there's, so that's no, what I was, there's no. no data. So we, we published a paper looking at the frequency going from polyps to cancer. So it went from low to high, as I described. But there's no outcome data from polyps okay. that I know of out there. There's outcome data, as I showed you, from cancers. Cancer. Right. Thank you. Dr. Tedler. One of the major assumptions of making racial comparisons is um, self-identification of race is a very good substitute for genetic ancestry. So my uh, question is, how, uh, what do you see as the role of ancestry markers in uh, subdefining, better defining your uh, racial or uh, ancestry background? And uh, as a related question, uh, how much of variation do you see within a self-identified racial population, let's say blacks? So, um, so that's a very good question. Uh, this was a topic of discussion at the um, AECR uh, uh, Cancer Disparities Conference last November, and I was fortunate to be a big part of that. Um, uh, that, that question came up about current studies versus future studies, and since we have better genomic markers. So, so I think there's a lot of depends. So one is uh, people have these cohorts and they're collecting new cohorts. Um, most of the currently collected cohorts are based on self-identified race. 
There are some data, um, and there was a, we had several presentations on this at this conference, uh, that the, the difference between self-identify and genomic was had a pretty high concordance, 90, 92%. So there's still maybe 8%, 10% off, um, depending on what your cutoffs are for the genomics. Some of them were, you know, cut off of 20% out of, of, let's say, African markers versus European markers, et cetera. Some were 30%. So it depends, so a lot of it depends on what your genomic identification cutoff is uh, uh, as compared to the self-identified. Um, so self-identified could be, um, as I said, in this one example that this guy gave was in the 90% range. Um, uh, uh, it could be higher or lower, probably depending on what you cut off. Um, how, so the, the, the secondary question that came up is, should studies that go for NIH funding <laughs> be defined by genomic markers? And so at least at the discussion there, not, at least not yet. Um, in my, so that also you would need blood samples. So what I got from the North Carolina study when I did that, all I had was the tumor sample, which has a completely uh, modified genome compared to what's in the, uh, the, um, the diploid blood genome uh, that we have. So we did, I didn't have access to that, so I had to rely on what the North Carolina officials told me uh, was the race. Um, and by the way, on that study, we were blinded by the race. We did the analysis and then we broke the code um, only after we did the analysis. And I didn't know who was black or white when we did the analysis. So I think in the future that may come into play, um, but I, I, you'd have to have the right definitions for that. Right now, the NIH still use self-identified uh, definitions for it, under its program, um, but that, that possibly could change. But that's all I can say about it right now. We have time for one question, quick one. Uh, so enjoy the presentations. So uh, first, do you think genetics is playing a role in the location of the colon cancer in terms of being on the right side and left side, of, and in terms of um, where it shows up? Because I, I know you were saying that in one case, it seems to be um, more so on the right side, but then for African Americans, it seems to be kind of like just relative, relative, relatively um, evenly distributed. Um, so I was just curious, do you think genetics is playing a role in that? Um, um, no, I know, no, actually in African Americans, particularly whether you have MSI for both African Americans and Caucasians and African Americans, but without MSI seems to have a slightly predominance on the right side. So is that genetics? That's a good question. Um, it still may be environment. And when I say environment, I mean the environment in the colon which is a complex milieu of everything that's uh, uh, excreted and secreted from the pancreas and the bile and the liver to the things that you ingest, to bacterial products, the microbiota, et cetera. Does that influence it? Some people believe uh, the environment might have a more role. Now, the, the in Lynch syndrome, which could affect any race, that clearly is predominantly on the right side. And you can argue whether the genetics predispose it, or is it the genetics and environmental mixture that predisposes it to be on the right side? So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying in African Americans, genetics is the driver for a right side lesion. The evidence from 40 years of American Cancer Society and, and also in our study showed that there was a higher incidence on the right side, but I don't know if genetics is the sole driver for that. Okay, I think uh, this session is concluded. Uh, this was the session on molecular basis of colon cancer. We thank our esteemed uh, speakers for giving us all that background. Um, thank you very much.